Hello and welcome to Westview's online worship. Thank you for joining us today as we worship together online. We do want to extend a welcome to all of you joining us online. And if you want to connect with us, we do invite you to visit our webpage. If you scroll to the bottom, there is a contact place where you can let us know that you've joined, uh, give us any questions that you might have, or to submit prayer requests. This Sunday, we are uh, taking a break from the life of Jesus, and we are actually talking a little bit about living in an anxious world, and we will be digging deeper into Psalm 27. We do have a few announcements for this Sunday. One is a reminder that if you've been working on those eggs for Lent, those are due this Sunday. Uh, you can still probably drop them off over the next couple of days if you have one in hand and I'll be working on putting something together over the next week or two. And when that's together, we do invite you to come take a look at the display that we put together with all those wonderful eggs that have been coming in. I'd also like to let you know that we do have Easter events coming up. Good Friday has been planned for 1030 on Good Friday and stay tuned for more information about Easter weekend. I'd also like to let you know that there are potentially going to be some changes with our online opportunity to worship together. We are going to make another attempt at getting live streaming going. So uh, stay tuned and we will give you more details. And we do hope to start that maybe in the next couple weeks. And for this morning, I would like to now hand it over to Sue who will share with us our call to worship. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 63, verses 1 to 4. O oh God, you are my God, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in a sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. Let's worship together.
Hi everyone! Aren't you excited that March break has just started? I wonder if you're looking forward to some fun things to do. I know our family has some fun things that we would like to do. Well, because it's March break, we often take a lot of things home from school. And I don't know if you noticed, but right before March break, or at the end of the school year, or the beginning, our backpacks just feel so heavy. There's so many books that we need to carry, and you know, school supplies. It just is so heavy. You know, sometimes I think a heavy backpack is a bit like the worries that we carry. We really worry about a lot of things in this world and they're kind of heavy to carry too. We worry about, you know, maybe friends at school or our grades, or maybe we worry about someone who's sick. How are they gonna be? Are they gonna get better? Or we worry about big things in the world. These are all big worries and sometimes they are a lot for us to carry. The good news is God wants to help us carry these burdens. If we look in the Bible, we can see that God talks about worry. And in Psalm chapter 68, verse 19, he says, Praise be to the Lord, our God, our Savior, who daily bears our burdens. That means God wants to come alongside us and he wants to carry those heavy things in our life. So he invites us to come to him and tell him, these are the things that I'm worried about. And he wants to hear us and he wants to walk with us and support us. So don't carry all those burdens by yourself. Come to God, give him all those worries and pray to him and he will carry them for you.
The scripture reading for today is Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I asked of the Lord, that I will seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent he will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make merry to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You who have been my help, do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O oh God of my salvation. If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O oh Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. May the Lord continue to bless us through the reading of his word. Amen. On February 24th, just a little over a week ago, Europe saw the largest military mobilization since World War II. By air, land, and sea, Russia, the most powerful nation in Europe, launched a full-scale attack on the vast and ancient land of Ukraine and its 44 million people. Missiles flew into military targets and airports, apartment buildings, hospitals and schools. Putin's tanks rolled into cities, but their progress was slower than expected. As if all that might was not enough, if pushed and opposed, Putin spoke of consequences, the like of which you have never seen. It was a clear threat that he could resort to, nu to nuclear weapons, and it sent chills around the world. What are the things that you are afraid of? What are the things which rob you of sleep and a sense of peace and contentment? If you are a baby boomer like I am, we often heard that we were living in an age of anxiety. After the Holocaust, we knew of the human capacity for evil and the possibility of total destruction since we had entered into the age of the nuclear bomb. Kids at school participated in drills, huddling under desks as if they would protect them. There were those who put, uh, purchased potassium iodide pills as a guard against radiation. The rich were building bunkers in the distant hills, stocked with water and imperishables, and a menacing stash of automatic weapons in case there were desperate survivors or looters. The age of anxiety was a phrase coined by W. H. Auden and was a title of his book of poetry in which four friends gather one evening in a pub in Manhattan 
and begin sharing their fears and doubts into the early hours of the morning. Many reviewers did not think it was very good poetry, but it won him a Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> Leonard Bernstein wrote a symphony inspired by its message. The title, The Age of Anxiety, captured a mood which we can un understand and relate to in our time. We're still living in an age of anxiety. 18% of the population, about one in five, suffer anxiety disorder. It is the most common psychiatric complaint. And there are many who are heavily medicated with Xanax. The reasons for their anxiety are varied and complex. Some are worried about climate change and global warming, <laughs> as we all should be. All around the world, we have been experiencing extreme weather events. Said a U.S. Senator last summer, California is burning, Oregon is burning, Greece is burning, Siberia is burning. One of the most powerful hurricanes ever made landfall in the Gulf Coast just days ago. There is horrific drought impacting countries throughout the world and July was the hottest month ever recorded. Scientists say the effects of global war warming is guaranteed to intensify in the next 30 years, with hotter heat waves, more intense droughts, and more catastrophic flooding. In some universities, over 70% of the students describe describe themselves as suffering from eco-anxiety. Or I think of the anxiety created by COVID. It seems like a long two years of winter that we have lived through COVID and its deadly spawn of variants. Parents were worried for their children uh, and the changing rules to attend school or to stay home. Frustration spilled over into the so-called freedom convoy with truckers who were tired of all the restrictions and wanted to be free. And soon they were joined by others with any kind of frustration or complaint. But as bad as COVID could get, there were and are those who fear the vaccine even more with conspiracy theories feeding their deeply rooted phobias. Floods, tornadoes, viruses, population explosion, shortages of drinking water, drought and conflict, war, Ukraine and Russia. A friend asked me not long ago, do you think we are coming to the end of the world? What kind of world will there be for our children and their children? In what way does David's psalm and its soaring faith and confidence speak to us? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a fortress protecting my life. Should I be frightened of anything? Perhaps there was a day for David when those words could roll off his tongue with ease with the brash courage of youth and the swagger that God was with him. After all, he had felled a Goliath with a slingshot. His confidence was high and he became the darling of the people. He was invited to be the court musician to calm the jagged nerves of the reigning monarch, King Saul. Life couldn't be better. He was heady with faith and confidence. But then life would catch up with him. King Saul was flushed with jealousy and wanted him dead. He hurled a spear at David and missed him by a whisker. David knew he could no longer be the harpist in the, in the palace of the king. And the bad news kept rolling in. His best friend, Jonathan, was decapitated in battle. The day came when Saul also was killed and David ascended to the throne. He seemed 
blessed of God in every way, but he did not receive a pass on pain and suffering. His child with Bathsheba became deathly ill. He fasts and prays, but God is not there to help him, and his child dies. His charismatic oldest son, Absalom, led a rebellion to take over the throne. David had to flee for his life. Where was God then? When in the end Absalom was trapped in a tree, David's commander Joab thrust three darts into his heart. But there was no triumph for David in his son's death. He tore his, his robes and cried out in inconsolable grief, O oh, Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, would that I had died in your place. David was dear to the heart of God, but his faith did not protect him from the harshest moments of human experience. Life at times is so utterly unfair, and being a good man or woman does not protect you from its vagaries. We must take reasonable precautions, but there is no escaping the cruel twists of life which are part of our earthly experience. C.S. Lewis marries Joy Davidson, Davidman. But for all the love they had for each other, it would not be long before she is dead of cancer. Harold Kushner writes his book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And he was reflecting about the death of his 17-year-old son who died of progeria or accelerated aging. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane faces an ugly and humiliating end. He groans in agony, let this cup pass from me. But there was no escaping the cross. Or think of the apostles and martyrs burned at the stake or impaled or fed to hungry wild animals in the early years of the church. How could they bear the unbearable? How could they sing of God's goodness and grace? What is it that sustained them? It was more than stoicism. There was faith. <laughs> but what does that mean? What kind of faith do we need? How can faith help you in heartache and trouble? I enjoy the works of Michael Ondaatje and his scintillating descriptions and uh, the ways in which he builds up his characters in the context of ordinary events and places. He's a Tamil-speaking writer originally from Sri Lanka, famous for his book, The English Patient, which was made into a movie. He came to Canada as a young man and is now an officer of the Order of Canada. His book, Anil's Ghost, is set in the context of civil war in Sri Lanka. There's bloodshed and revenge and retaliation, each round escalating the brutality of the previous round. What's new? With war, there is always intemperate violence and the thirst for revenge. In the last chapter of his book, we see a broken-hearted man who has lost his wife to war. He has nothing to live for, but he's slowly rebuilding a statue of the Buddha. His faith was saying to him he was part of something far bigger than himself. That is what faith means. And it means to trust in something far bigger than anything within us. And in our case, our faith is built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Can you hold on to the truth that we are part of something far bigger than ourselves and more? Our God is a God of love. We know this because Jesus came into our world. God came into our world in his son, Jesus Christ. 
And as Paul says in Romans 8, there is nothing in all of creation which can keep us from his love. That is a faith, a conviction that enables you to face any threatening fears, knowing that the God of creation is on your side and that we are part of something far bigger than ourselves. We're part of God's family. Bad things may happen, but that kind of faith frees you to give of yourself to others, to turn the other cheek, to be unconcerned about your status and place, not minding being the underdog, living as if love is all that matters, because that is God's way. How can you nourish that kind of faith? What is so dominant in the Psalms is the perception and joy of God's presence. A couple of weeks ago, we considered the transfiguration, wonderful, miraculous, the door of heaven being cracked open a little bit so that we earthlings could see what is on the other side. Some experience God in a small, quiet voice as did Elijah amid the sound and fury of a storm. Some may experience him like the huddled disciples in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, breaking out in ecstasy. <coughs> Some experience God's presence in hymns and liturgy, or in the reading of sacred scriptures, or in the wonder and beauty of his creation. I think of Annie Dillard and her perception of God in the marvels of nature in Tinker Greek, Creek, or the inspiring words of Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Earth is crammed with heaven, and every common bush is ablaze with God. Those who see take off their shoes. The rest just sit around and pick blackberries. I enjoy looking at our backyard, backyard garden in the morning, especially in the summertime. And I see three different kinds of sunflowers, all craning for the sun. Russian mammoth in the back, Moulin Rouge del Sol. And in the foreground are the cosmos and morning glories. And I am deeply grateful for their gentle reminder of the God of creation. In all the horrifying incidents, accidents, and events in our world, our fears and growing uncertainties or gnawing uncertainties about the future, this is still God's world and He is near. Dear friends, amid your fears and anxieties and in our troubled world, Practice the presence of God. Be mindful. Breathe deeply. And as you're inhaling, think of your breath as the very breath of God's Spirit. Isn't that how close God is to us? And let that be for you a daily exercise. And see God in the little things around you. And let faith take the place of fear. Will you join me to pray for ourselves and others? Loving Heavenly Father, we come into your presence to offer these prayers, knowing that you encourage us to bring our concerns and causes for celebration to you because we are your children and you love us. You love the whole world and gave the life of your only begotten son for it. Your heart must ache over the ways in which it is broken and lost, sad and afraid. We pray for our own Westview Church family and ask that you would fill us with your spirit as we continue to reflect your love to each other 
to our community and beyond in these uncertain times. We thank you for providing the interim pastor we need at this time and pray for your guidance as we seek a new permanent team leader. Help us discover who you want us to be and who you want us to welcome into this part of your family going forward. We pray for people we know who are ill or injured or suffering in any way, and we name them silently to you now. We pray for ourselves, and in the quiet of this moment, we name some of the things that give us cause for concern today. We also name some of the things, the people and experiences that make our life good. We give you thanks, and we pray for your peace to fill our hearts, our relationships, our city, our country, and our world. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, who makes it possible for us to say, it is well with my soul. Amen.
worship with us today. Let's end our time together with this blessing upon you. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you all.